Hello, everybody. Um, I think most of you know that I'm Karen James, and I'm a staff scientist here at the lab. And it's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Miriam Goldstein. She is originally from Manchester, New Hampshire, and she did her undergraduate degree at Brown and her PhD at Scripps Institute of Oceanography with Mark Oman, in case any of you know who that is. Um, and that was about nine months ago that she finished. So I think congratulations are still in order. <laughs> <laughs> um, and now she is doing something very interesting. She is a Naus Sea Grant, Knaus Sea Grant Fellow with the US House of Representatives Natural Resources Committee, parentheses, Democrats. Um, yeah. And she's also a very active and talented, I must say, science communicator. Um, especially online, and she's appeared on CNN, CBS, NPR, Science Friday, BBC, and more. And some of you may know her from the time she spent blogging at Deep Sea News. Um, and so without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Goldstein. Thank you so much, and thanks for having me here. It is definitely a treat to be out of DC in the middle of August and up here in beautiful, beautiful Maine. So I really appreciate the opportunity. How is the volume? Is this good? I can't really tell. Awesome, great. Um, so today I'm going to give a, basically a kitchen sink talk um, about both my research on marine debris in the North Pacific and the area termed the garbage patch, work on social media, and a quick blast through how science uh, policy is, is incorporated into Congress and federal level decision making. So I'm going to cover a lot of things really fast, um, which are somewhat loosely connected. Uh, and hopefully it will take about 40 minutes, leaving plenty of time for questions. If you would like to go into any of these things more deeply, I would be happy to do so. But although these, say, these things are all connected basically by the idea that inputs and connectivity. Plastic debris in the ocean, it's an input that we are sort of doing by accident and the currents make many areas that are, don't seem to be too close to each other. For example, Asia and the United States are connected by the ocean and share this common pool of plastic debris. Social media, also about inputs and connectivity. You can, are putting the material out there, but without actually making those connections, it's not necessarily going to go anywhere. Same thing for communicating science to policymakers. Um, a lot of us hope that just by putting really amazing papers out into the world, uh, they will magically make it to policymakers, but yeah, weak laughter. Uh, it is sadly not the case. Um, so for the first part, I'm just going to talk a little bit about plastic and what it's doing in the middle of the North Pacific. Um, so to start at the beginning, uh, plastic has actually been around for much longer than I thought when I started working on this issue. Um, the first man-made polymer was actually celluloid, uh, used in old films. Um, it was made by plant cellulose. But what we think of as plastic today is derived from petroleum, and that didn't come into widespread consumer usage until Bakelite in the early part of the 20th century, but really not until post-World War II when it really came into use in most people's households. And plastic is a very different material than we had before because it is extremely resistant to degradation. Um, that's why it's handy and very lightweight. So before that, anything that you put in the environment would eventually break down. Metal rusts, wood rots, eventually all these things go away, but plastic is so resistant to basically being eaten by microbes that it doesn't break down. And that is fantastic, especially when you're working on the ocean. Like I'm very glad my glasses are not biodegradable. Um, but it also causes unintentional problems. And so it was only 20 years after when plastic debris was first introduced that it appeared in the North Atlantic and North Pacific subtropical gyres. And I'll show you where those are in a moment. Um, and until, uh, and that, it, that wasn't really recognized as a problem very widely even then. Um, until finally people realized that dumping plastic in the ocean was bad and banned that practice in 1989. So before that, it was perfectly legal and was common practice to just chuck plastic off ships when you were a certain distance from shore. And in fact, the research vessels at Scripps, I have it from people who were there at the time, 
did just that. It was just what everyone did. They just chucked the whole plastic bag right off the boat as long as you were that certain distance offshore. So we don't do that anymore, but there is a lot of plastic accumulated in that time and continues to be lost to this day. So now we have this situation, plastic pollution, which is ubiquitous in marine environments. You see it on rocky shores, on coral reefs. This is a picture from the abyssal plain in the deep sea, it's a plastic bag. Uh, coastal Philippines with all of this uh, shallow pelagic debris and on the open ocean. Um, and so again, because of these lightweight, very resistant to degradation qualities, you really find it everywhere. And the most dramatic impacts of that are with wildlife, particularly in ingestion in larger animals and entanglement. One of the reasons that um, most many people cut their six-pack rings now, and I do myself, is because of this famous picture of a heron with a six-pack ring stuck on its neck. And although most entanglements that you now find in the ocean have to do with fishing-related debris, so there's a Hawaiian monk seal, which are endangered, it's stuck in some line, sea turtle that ran afoul of some monofilament, um, and you have habitat impacts as well. So, for example, this is a beach in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, which are mostly uninhabited, that has a large amount of oceanic debris washed up on it. Uh, that's a baby albatross in the foreground. And um, you also have, in, 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 in many of these larger animals, such as the albatross, you have ingestion impacts where their parents scavenge plastic debris and feed them to the chicks, and the chicks die. So this one, for example, has a lighter in its stomach. And uh, even with some of the animals that you wouldn't think would interact with plastic debris, sometimes you do. I really want to know where the sea urchin is going with that fork. Um, it's a more non-traditional way for sea urchin feeding. Uh, but you can have habitat, habitat impacts even where you don't expect it. However, so these are for macroplastics large pieces of debris, but microplastic is a little different. And the, the technical definition is pieces that are less than five millimeters in diameter. And these can be released directly into the ocean, such as this is a nurdle, um, this round piece. Uh, and that is the feed for creating injection molded stuff. So when you want to make a plastic object in the manufacturer, you pour those in and you mold it through heat into your object. So that's why if you look closely at a lot of like toys, you can see the little line around it. That's from the injection molding process. So nurdles um, can be released directly into the ocean. Um, microfibers, um, something that, oh, no, I'm going to get the abbreviation wrong, Mary. Marine Eco Environmental Research Institute. Yes in Blue Hill is, is working on, those are released directly, can be released directly into the ocean as well. Um, other pieces are formed by the breakdown of larger objects. So these fragments here are formed by something larger breaking down. And this occurs in the ocean when UV light makes the plastic more brittle by releasing plasticizers. I can talk about that in more detail if anyone's interested. But then the wave motion of the brittle plastic breaks off these little crumbs. Microplastic has been found in sediment, in the sea surface, and in the water column. And there's been a lot of studies showing that it can be ingested by fishes and benthic marine invertebrates. I'm going to talk a little bit more about ingestion in pelagic marine invertebrates, or the animals that are living in the open ocean, inver invertebrate-wise. Anyway. So uh, to backtrack a little bit, I mentioned the North Atlantic and North Pacific subtropical dryers. Um, so when you look, this is probably review to a lot of you, but just in case, um, when you look at a map of the surface currents of the world ocean, these uh, five big circular features stand out. And those are the subtropical gyres. And they're formed by a combination of the major winds of the world, the westerlies and the trade winds, that push the water over and then it starts to rotate as the Earth turns. So that's clockwise in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern hemisphere. So these big circular formations are natural phenomena. They happen every time you have a big ocean basin. And they are convergence areas. Stuff gets stuck in them and stuck in the middle. And the reason the subtropical gyres are important is because they are just a huge proportion of the Earth. The five of them together cover 40% of the Earth's surface. They're an enormous ecosystem that we actually don't know that much about. But what we do know is that all five subtropical gyres are low productivity and high biodiversity. Um, so they, if you look at this map of the chlorophyll concentration of the, of the surface ocean, they stand out as these low chlorophyll blue areas. Um, so they're almost, people have said they're analogous to a desert, although I might be taken to task if there's any oceanographers in the room. It's, 
It's not a perfect analogy. But essentially, they, are, they don't have a lot of like, really productive plant life. Things are sort of quieter there. They're relatively stable. Um, they are, as I said, the largest contiguous biome on Earth. And in the North Pacific, it has been in place since the Pliocene. So it's a very old ecosystem. Originally, for the ecologists in the room, they're studied as a stable climax community, meaning that they were thought to be very unchanging. But it turns out that they have a lot more going on than we originally thought, although they still are relatively stable, say, compared to the Gulf of Maine. There's much less seasonal variation. And also, for speaking as someone who gets really seasick, they're a great place to work. Super calm because of some of these factors, like it's a nice glassy day right in the middle. So that's another, another perk of working out there. Um, combined with the ocean circulation is wind circulation. So these two factors interact to trap floating materials in certain areas of the North Pacific. This is a map um, of the North Pacific. So here's Hawaii, California, Oregon, Washington, just to orient you. And the colors are the wind speed. Red and orange being a lot of wind, white and blue, not much wind. And they're averaged over 10 years of August. So in the summer, and in fact in most of the year, but mostly in the summer, you get this big white spot in the middle of the ocean between Hawaii and California, and that's the North Pacific High, if any of you are sailors. Um, so it's a high-pressure uh, high system that just sits there off the coast. It's very calm and nice underneath, and it interacts with that oceanic circulation to just get stuff gets stuck in underneath it. It's very calm and doesn't go anywhere. So that is what people term the eastern garbage patch. There is a similar area in the western Pacific, but once you've heard of the eastern and western garbage patch, they're talking about these areas. And some people term the whole thing the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, but these are more um, PR names than ones with specific scientific definitions. I became interested in this issue uh, through PR basically as well. So I started seeing these headlines when I was in graduate school. There's a Great Pacific Garbage Patch. It poses a huge cleanup dump. It's twice the size of America. And it stretches from Hawaii into Japan. And it's uh, 3.5 million something. That you apparently don't have to say. Yeah, there's no units there. 3.5 million sounds like a lot, though. It's definitely really bad. Sorry for you who heard that joke last night, too. Uh, <laughs> um, so. It sounded really bad, but there is not very much scientific information on it. The headlines here have been based off um, the really amazing work of a lot of nonprofits who had raised awareness, but through this sort of television game of the media, it had gotten turned into a giant floating garbage dump. So uh, popular conceptions started to look like this, of a large conglomeration, an island that you could basically walk on. Uh, this is a graphic novel featuring a uh, gentleman who goes to the garbage patch and claims it. He, like, his name is Chaz Worthington. Uh, he, he calls it New Texas. He plants a little flag. He wrestles an octopus. It's very, it's very, it, it's very entertaining. Um, but so you can see he's walking on this large amount of trash. Uh, this is another graphic novel. This one features a sad, lonely trash island that nobody loves, so it's sad. Um, this, if you Google Pacific Garbage Patch, you'll see this picture, which I've termed Canoe Guy. Um, canoe Guy pops up all over the place. And it is a real picture, but it takes, is it, it, it's from a canal in Manila. It's not the middle of the Pacific. Uh, you wouldn't get too far just going to the middle of, between Hawaii and California, just via canoe. And this last one is from a short film uh, narrated by Werner Herzog and about a sad plastic bag that is discarded and alone and it tries to find the magical island of plastic bags so it can have friends. Um, I do recommend it. It's on YouTube. It's really great. But uh, this is how he depicts the magical island of, of plastic bags. However, the real garbage patch looks like this. Um, there is no large floating conglomeration as you saw in those previous pictures. The true nature of the garbage patch is actually much more subtle and involves small pieces of microplastics spread out over the surface. So in this, in this photo, which is taken looking straight down from the bridge of a ship, there's a one meter scale bar. You can see that there are these small white flecks floating on the surface of the ocean. And that is really what the garbage patch is made of, these tiny pieces of microplastics spread out. There are a surprisingly large number of them. In this one area, we counted more than 23 little pieces, just in an area maybe the size of this front place, space that I'm standing in. Um, but really, to see them, uh, we used zooplankton nets to filter out that water and gather them together, and you can really see how many there are. So I will show you some of those data uh, momentarily. 
So the two science questions I'm going to talk about today are what, how much plastic is there? What's the abundance and distribution of microplastic in the Northeast Pacific? And what are its impacts? In particular, I'm focusing on surface dwelling marine invertebrates um, that are living in the areas that have the highest concentrations of microplastic. I'm just in the interest of time, I'm not going to show these data. Most of the plastic is surface in calm conditions, though it does get mixed down in higher wind conditions. So we're just going to be talking about the surface of the open ocean for right now. Uh, these data are on three cruises in 2009, 2010, and 2011, uh, Scripps Cruise, a NOAA Cruise, and a Sea Education Association Cruise. And they were collected with two different kinds of nets. Um, some of the data from the 70s and 80s uh, was collected with a new stone net. Uh, which you just doesn't have floats, you pull it behind the boat, it's half in and half out of the water. Uh, the more recent data was collected with a manta net, which is, has these little floats that keeps it right at the air-sea interface. Plastic was sorted under dissecting microscopes by my intrepid volunteers and myself. There, there, there they go. And uh, when, oh, I should have said this picture first. This is what it looks like when you do a manta tow. So that's 15 minutes of a net towing on the surface. It's about a swimming pool size amount of water that's concentrated into a jar. So you can see all that microplastic floating on the surface. Um, so we sorted it out under dissecting microscopes and we used a ZoScan system, which is a modified flatbed scanner to count and measure the plastic. So here's what the scans look like with all the plastic arranged on it. And what the ZoScan system does, it takes little thumbnails of the plastic and you can measure them. So here's two pieces of what those pictures look like. So what we found when we looked at all 32,090 particles that we collected in summer 2009 and fall 2010 was that most plastic is small. This is the cumulative distribution function um, of the, all of our plastic pieces uh, by diameter in millimeters. This little hatch marks at the bottom is the data density. So I do want to caveat, obviously our, man, our plankton nets don't catch really large items, but they do catch items that are 30 or 40 centimeters in diameter just fine. So we do feel this is an accurate representation of what's floating on the surface. So what we see is that we look at the cumulative distribution function, 91% of the debris on the surface meets, it's less than five millimeters in diameter. It meets the definition of microplastic. This is very small. And also, this microplastic floating on the surface of the ocean has increased by 100-fold over the last four decades. So this is a meta-analysis which combines our data, data from samples that were archived at Scripps, and data in the literature, and also unpublished data from nonprofits. So basically everything we could find. And we binned it um, into an earlier period, 1972 to 1987. And um, I'm just showing you we have mass concentration as well. I'm just showing you the numeric concentration. So numbers of particles per cubic meter water. Um, and you can see that in the earlier period, that big white spot, the area, the eastern garbage patch under the North Pacific High, that big white spot in the map that I showed you about still stands out as a relatively high plastic area. Oh, sorry, I should have said the black dots are the actual samples. So, you know, what, take th things like this corner with a grain of salt when there's not that many samples. It's interpolated. Um, so anyway, uh, so the North Pacific High still stands out as a relatively high plastic area, even in this earlier period. But when we look at nine years 1999 through 2010, it's increased by 100 times. So it used to be around 0.1 particle per cubic meter in, the, in that area, and now there are approximately 10, if there's red areas, particles per cubic meter. So there's been a substantial increase. I should add, uh, we saw a sort of marginally statistically significant increase off Alaska here, but we don't have all that much data, and we did not see any change in the eastern tropical Pacific down here. So uh, moving briskly right along, um, how are surface, we looked at two kinds of surface dwelling invertebrates that might be affected by microplastic. Ones that live right on the plastic as a, as a basically living, almost living on the plastic like it's the bottom of the ocean. So they're benthic invertebrates stuck to the plastic or living associated with it. And ones that are actually eating it. Floating plastic acts as essentially an island of hard substrate in the middle of the ocean. The North Pacific does not have floating seaweed like the Sargasso Sea, so pretty much all that's floating out there is pumice, logs, the occasional stray bits of kelp, and plastic. So this has increased the hard substrate that animals can and associate microbes and plants can live on out there. And there is a specialized group of organisms that is adapted to living on floating material, termed the rafting community, 
And so these, have been, these animals have been around for a long time, but we hypothesize that they've dramatically increased in abundance due to this increase in plastic debris, which is providing a substrate for them to live on. So we looked at the plastic debris as whether it was transporting potentially harmful or invasive species around the Pacific because living right on this plastic debris. What we found when we looked at 240, oh, and I should have added, this is in collaboration with uh, Hank Carson and Mark Erickson. Um, we looked at uh, 242 debris items, small and large, found 96 taxa. Say taxa, we could not identify them all to species, so we did, went to, to the finest taxonomic definition we could. 11 phyla, there's the phyla, so mostly arthropods and cnidarians, mollusks, chordates are, um, what were the chordates? Oh, that was the so associated fishes. So mo mostly arthropods, not too surprising. That tends to be what inhabits the rafting community the most, uh, a lot of barnacles. And also the feeding types were also not too surprising. A lot of suspension feeders and omnivores that were feeding on the suspension feeders. Although we did find a few uh, outliers here that were kind of interesting. There are a few boring organisms. We found one shipworm, uh, which is actually a mollusk living in the plastic. So, and a few stray uh, boring uh, amphipods. We did find two species of potential concern after sorting all that. The most uh, alarming of which is a coral pathogen, which is a ciliate, called Halofolliculina. So on this picture, it's these little dots right here, the ciliates, these little uh, brown dots. Um, and this causes disease that looks like this in corals and was recently introduced to Hawaii um, in about 2008. So we don't know if the vector for its introduction to Hawaii was plastic debris, but we were quite surprised to find a coral pathogen just living right on a piece of floating pa plastic debris. And it's because these, there is a large amount of debris input to sensitive Pacific islands, the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, Palmyra, um, this is a potential area of concern. We also found a crab called Herbstia. It's a magoid crab um, living on plastic debris. And we were not able to identify, we only found one individual, we were not able to identify it to species. But other Herbstia species are invasive to areas of the Mediterranean and can have caused problems there. There are other known invaders that are already established around the Pacific Rim, also inhabiting the plastic debris, some acorn barnacles, bryozoans, and some very lost blue, um, blue mussels. Um, various kinds, but uh, they are already established. We couldn't tell if they were at where they were coming from. So the plastic ingestion experiments looked at two different kinds of organisms. Uh, the surface zooplankton, primarily copepods, and gooseneck barnacles. So copepods, they live in the surface layer. Uh, I caught them with a live collection net very, very gently and lovingly and incubated them with plastic that we added that fluoresces under a black light. So there's the uh, high-tech incubation setup uh, on the Sea Education Association vessel, which is Robert C. Siemens, so they gave me a little corner there. So they were on this plankton wheel for 24 hours, incubated with plastic, temperature controlled by this water bath here. And then we preserved the fecal pellets and the animals and examined them under the fluorescence microscope, which would make the beads glow to see if they'd ingested the beads. Gooseneck barnacles were just opportunistically collected. They live on these larger floating items. There's all these gooseneck barnacles there. And we just dissected them under the microscope and looked at their gut contents for evidence of plastic ingestion. So it turns out that copepods ingest minimal amounts of microplastic in experimental conditions, or at least in these experimental conditions. They do ingest some microplastic. Here is, uh, these are both Calanus pacificus from near California. So there's a little bead in its foregut here, and then it's a couple beads in the urosome here. This is a fecal pellet, probably from a euphausid with a bead here. Um, but there would not, there wasn't a significant relationship between the amount of plastic ingested, sorry, the amount of plastic that was added to each chamber and how much they ingested in it. And they ingested it at surprisingly low rates. Uh, we knew they were eating because they were uh, producing fecal pellets here with no difference in fecal pellet production between the low, medium, and high plastic treatments. But they really just weren't ingesting it all that much. There was no difference between treatments in animals collected from the California Current right off of San Diego. And there was a marginal difference in the North Pacific gyre fauna with ones that were exposed to very high levels of plastic, 100 beads per liter, ingesting it a little bit more, but not very significantly. 
In contrast, uh, of the gooseneck barnacles that we collected, 33.5% had plastic in their guts that they had ingested in their natural habitat, living attached to floating material and floating around. So we looked at 385 barnacles. The majority uh, didn't, were zeros. They did not have plastic in their guts. But there was a substantial percentage that did, ranging from just a few pieces to up to 30 pieces in one individual. Um, and we think this is occurring because these barnacles are very unselective feeders. They just pretty much go for anything that floats by. And so there they had plastic in their guts. We didn't see any evidence of harm. They probably just would have passed it through their gut. Um, but it certainly was there at the time that we caught them. So to summarize the plastic section, most plastic in the North Pacific subtropical gyre, aka Pacific Garbage Patch, is microplastic. It's small. Um, it has substantially increased over the past four decades. It is transporting a few potentially harmful species that we were detected. And some animals that live associated with it, the gooseneck barnacles, are ingesting it. The zooplankton may not, but really more work is needed to really determine that. So the larger scale implications of this is that adding all this plastic to an ecosystem that would not naturally have hard substrates is a widespread alteration of the system. Um, there, it's, the, it, it has increased the substrate associated assemblage. There's recently been work by um, Eric Zettler and his colleagues at SEA and uh, MBL Woods Hole. Um, showing that the microbes that live on the plastic are very different than the microbes that would naturally like be float would be floating around in the water if there were no plastic. Um, it's being ingested by invertebrates, mesopelagic fish, uh, mainly mctophids, work done by my colleagues Pete Davis and Rebecca Ash, and seabirds. And there's an issue with plastic-associated toxins. These plastics accumulate um, certain toxins that are lipophilic, PCBs, DDTs, and that may transfer them out to the food chain. So that's work that's all ongoing. Be happy to talk about that more as well. Um, and the, the potential effect that I find the of most large-scale importance is the effect that's completely unknown on the oceanic biogeochemical cycling. By the these substrate associated communities are very different than the open ocean communities. And since nutrients in the subtropical gyres are really hard to come by, changing how nutrients move through the system could potentially have very large scale effects. And remember, we're talking about 40% of the Earth's surface. Like This is happening all over that 40% could have substantial effects on, for example, nitrogen cycling and phosphor cycling and even CO2. So that's a little hand waving to end this section right now. But it could be a potentially large scale change. So moving for something completely different, moving to the social media section, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work um, I and my colleagues, including Karen, have done on using social media for science outreach and some ways you might think about doing that if something that you're interested in doing. Um, and it's the, it's a, if you haven't encountered this on the internet, it's a well-known fact that cute animals can't spell. That's why. That's so most of us think of the internet like this. Um, we are supposed to be doing this. The internet is doing this. And we have to ignore it in order to get stuff done. But actually, if you're actually interested in talking to people, it is where the people are. So this is on a log scale of traditional media and new media and the uh, monthly audience of each. So scientific conference, say you have 1,000 people. I mean, most of these are not going to your talk, but maybe they'll look at your poster. Um, college class, science, the circulation of the print edition of Scientific American, a local paper, which in this case, because I lived in San Diego at the time, is the San Diego Union Tribune. San Diego is a pretty large city. It's like the 20th largest city in the US. So it's got a decent circulation. National paper, which is the New York Times in this case, and then Twitter blogs and Facebook. It doesn't look so dire here on a log scale. When you look at it on a linear scale, you really can see the difference in the number of people that are using these media. There are just a lot of people on Twitter, blogs, and Facebook, and that is how many people these days are getting their information. So if you want to get people information about your science, then that is a good place to go. I unfortunately do not have time to really go over this in detail, but I'd be happy to talk to you about it more if there is interest. This is a very general taxonomy of how science and social media, how different social media tools are used for science, done by um, my colleague Bethany Brookshire, AKA PsyCurious on Twitter, who's a neuroscientist. And so she's just talking about blogs, Twitter, and Facebook, and then the different things that people do with them. 
So for example, uh, blogs are long form and more permanent. You put a post up and it stays up. You can find it on Google. So they're a really great so way for commenting on current events or for an info source. People also use them for personal reflection. There's a large life and science community, for example, um, about uh, w you know, how do, uh, how, what is a scientific life like? How do I balance all these things? How do I, what is the amount of time I should spend grant writing versus doing research? So that's sort of that personal reflection area. And then uh, to contrast that with Twitter, which is a more shorter, uh, which more ephemeral, I should say, uh, which people use mostly as info source and link sharing, but not so much for commentary. Um, so these, these uh, I can't unfortunately go over this in too much detail, but these have different audiences as well. So blogs have a large lay audience, it's scientific, Twitter has a professional audience as well, and so it's best to sort of know what you're going for before you pick your tool. This flowchart uh, is something that uh, my colleague Holly Bick and I designed to help people pick their tools and how much time they wanted to spend. And it appears in more formal form in a PLOS biology paper that if you want to see it, you can look up. Um, but mostly what you want to decide is if you want to do social media, what do you want to do? Um, some people want to create new content. For example, there's, a, there's no community out there that is talking about squid in the way that I burn to talk about squid. I want to create a squid blog. Um, they would say, I want to find a community. Like, I want to find the existing squid blogs that I can join in and talk about squid. Or, for example, there's too much, I want to be a curator. There's so much awesome squid stuff all over the internet. I want to bring it into one all together, other people's stuff that they've created, and create the ultimate squid resource. So I would call this curation, uh, bringing together those resources, community, self-explanatory, and creation. And you can use, these can all take different amounts of time. Um, so you can, for example, do any of these things in fairly minimal time by just posting things on Facebook, doing a guest post on an established blog, working with your PIOs, or you can spend a lot of time. You can start your own blog, which to do correctly does take a lot of time if you really want to build an audience. So briefly to end this section, um, we'll talk a about a few case studies of good, bad, and indifferent. But the main take home message is social media has social in it for a reason. Uh, it is a two way medium. It is not something that you can just put information out there and not interact. It does not work well like that. Um, so these, I'll show you some examples of this going well and not so well. This is a great example. Um, this is the Science is Vital campaign in the UK, where science, they, it, in 2010, the science budget for the UK was getting cut very drastically. So scientists organized using social media tools and actually ended up marching in the streets. And the budget was restored. So it was a very effective leveraging of social media tools for a specific change in science and for a topic that most scientists really care a lot about. Another great example of uh, using social media, this time aimed at both a scientific and a general audience, was the overly, honest method, the overly honest methods hashtag. This was scientists posting things on Twitter about how things really happen. So you might write in your method, the Eppendorf tubes were shaken for between 30, 30 seconds and a minute. But in reality, the Eppendorf tubes were shaken like a Polaroid picture until the song ended. So that was the overall one. So people would post things like, instead of saying, two thirds of the water monitors were recovered, well, we only recovered two thirds because a hurricane blew away the rest and we lost them forever and lost $1,000. Um, we decided to use technique Y because it's new and sexy, plus hot and cool, and because we could. <laughs> Incubation lasted three days because this is how long the undergrad forgot the experiment <laughs> in the fridge. And for those of you like that is, so it was really great way to both scientists making each other laugh and also just saying to a general audience, hey, like this is something that people are doing. These are real humans running these experiments and sometimes things don't go as you expect and science is actually really accessible. So a great way of demystifying the scientific process. That's not all done, you know, like, super, well, it is often done very fancily in labs, but sometimes you incubate for three days. Um, and sorry, forgive the profanity. This talk actually has a whole nother instance of profanity, so sorry about that. But this is the name. Um, I Effing Love Science is a Facebook group that has 6.6 .6 million followers, which is more than the combined population of Los Angeles and Chicago. So it is extremely successful. And what all it does is it posts cool things about science on Facebook, uh, funny pictures, educational pictures, etc. 
So it, um, so it is, it, regardless of whether you agree with its strategy, it is a highly successful form of outreach um, that is reaching more people than you or I will ever reach, and all showing that science is cool and positive. So in this case, the world listened. Yay, social media, it worked. So in these cases, the world also listened. Um, and so social media can also amplify things that are not so scientific. Um, for example, the mer connection between Mercury and autism is thoroughly debunked, but persists on the internet. And it's really hard, especially for a general audience, to pick out the fact, the, si the, the, the science from the pseudoscience. Same thing for fluoridation in uh, tap water is a large controversy in Portland, Oregon. Same thing for climate change, same thing for evolution. It's really hard to pick out the fact from the other surrounding detritus that accumulates on the internet. This can also be uh, personal, oops, uh oh, okay. Um, this can also involve scientists having personal uh, faux pas, major faux pas. These are two different scientists who posted things on the internet that really had consequences for them and their professional reputations. This guy um, is a neuroscientist who decided his female colleagues were insufficiently attractive for his taste at the major neuroscience conference, posted this on his personal Facebook, but it got out to his colleagues, and uh, he is no longer invited to the fun neuroscience parties. Um, same thing with this guy on Twitter. Uh, posted uh, this very offensive tweet, and he was actually formally censured by his university and not allowed to do grad school admissions anymore. So uh, in this case, it is that people can hear you. So in this case, the world listened, oops. It's really easy to be ineffective. I mean, this is the vast majority of where things go wrong. Very few people are like that offensive, um, hopefully, I hope. Um, but no, in reality, most people are not that offensive. But most people are just, uh, it's easy to be ineffective. Blogs, if you have to put in the time, if you really want to build a general audience, it takes time and high quality content. Twitter, it depends on if you want to, again, if you want to build an audience, it takes time and thought about how you want to do it. I can talk way more about this if anyone's interested. Facebook, I frankly discourage for general audience outreach because it has privacy problems, but for them, it's like, when do you really want to engage with that crazy uncle that you have that everyone can, all now your professional colleagues will see you fight with your crazy uncle about some issue. It can be a big mess. So it's easy to just be ineffective um, on these tools as well. So, but really the key is that it's a two-way street. Um, you have to in, be engaged with your audience if you're going to do social media. That's why it's called social media. If you don't want to engage, there are other ways to do that, but social media is not your way. So this is my, this is the final use of profanity, don't worry, but I just wanted to end this section with, um, it, it all depends on your audience. If you're talking to Congress, which I'm going to talk about just now, you want to be like, ah, you know, science, it's very important, but a general audience really has kind of this reaction. Science is really awesome, and that, you can get surprisingly far just doing that. So uh, for to the last five minutes, I'm going to talk about uh, my experience. <laughs> I know, <laughs> moving right along. Um, I'm going to talk about getting science into federal policy. Um, an extremely quick and shallow overview based on my whole six months of experience. Uh, so as uh, Karen mentioned in my introduction, I am a fellow with the House of Represent the House of Representatives Committee on Natural Resources Democrats, and again, so I am I basically function as a staff member assigned to the committee. So quickly go over the other players in this, because it turns out that it's not just me. Um, so obviously you have our elected officials, but what is also very important is what committees they sit on. Um, they can get more done in the topics of the committees that they sit on, because le for example, legislation that they introduce will have a greater chance of moving through committees. There's their staff in the personal office, and each uh, senator or representative will have a staff that specializes in, for example, natural resources issues that covers that topic area. So if you want to talk to someone about lobsters, like you're going to want to find their natural resources person. Um, it's not going to help you to talk to the military staffer about lobsters. They won't know anything, and they won't have any context. Um, frankly, the elected official may not know anything if they are from Kansas. So natural resources person is the one you want to target if you ever want to go talk to them. Committee staffers um, work for the committees. Uh, there are both, in all committees, there is the Democratic staff and the Republican staff who work for those members, primarily for the chairman, the head of the majority, 
which is the Republicans in the House and then the Democrats in the Senate, and ranking member, who's the head minority person. So in my committee, the ranking member is Peter DeFazio, who's from Oregon. So we basically work for him. So it means since he's the ranking we care a lot about old growth forests, for example. And when Ed Markey from Massachusetts was the ranking member, as he was early in the year, we cared a lot about New England ground fish. So there, whoever is in charge is pretty important. Um, there's the agencies, of course, NOAA, NASA, NIMS, et cetera. Organized groups of various kinds uh, that come and lobby and interact and that organize the representative senators' constituents to yell at them when they're doing something that those groups don't want them to do. So they're very important. And these include trade organizations, environmental nonprofits, academic associations. In the ocean world, Consortium for Ocean Leadership is a really great resource. It's a consortium of ocean-related uh, academic groups primarily. And of course, there's the actual constituents. Science is not a high priority. Uh, very few staffers and almost no members will read papers. Um, the only staffers that really read the primary literature might be committee staffers. But usually science is packaged through reports, such as from the Natural Resources Council, the media. They are all reading, they are all reading the major papers and the papers from their region. So if, you have a, if your work is covered by like the New York Times, it will be noticed. And I, in fact, often get sent articles from other offices. There is a microplastic study in the Great Lakes, and I got you know, all the staffers, it was in the New York Times, all the staffers sent me all these articles. Um, the agencies will also package science through various reports, or just by press releases, or just by asking them, and interest groups, of course, um, which package science both you know, in ways that scientists might like. That's one major thing that Consortium for Ocean Leadership does is represent the interests of the academic ocean community in ways that you might not like. Um, you can certainly find interest groups that, for example, um, are packaging all the pseudoscience about climate change for congressional consumption. Um, sound science, in any case, regardless of political affiliation, is an all too often the position that the member would want to support anyway. Very few of them will have their minds changed by science, uh, especially, and forget it if it's against the interests of their constituents. You can have the best fisheries survey that was ever created, but if it go, but you know, it will still be controversial if it means that you have to catch less fish in an area that depends on those fish. So there are different ways to get involved as a scientist, uh, which I'll briefly talk about. Again, can talk about these a lot more. Um, the easiest way is the agency's rulemaking process, which is really boring, but actually really important. Um, all, when the agencies make rules or regulations, as most people call them, they have to go through a public comment period, and that is the time to comment. Now, you get a lot of crazy comments, like poorly spelled, being like, I hate you, Noah, you suck. Those are not the most helpful, but the comments from scientists with credentials who write and engage with the science of the rule, whether in support or against it, are really listened to. And it also helps if the rule, if you're especially if you're against the rule, to comment because then we can say, you know, you can you, you can say if you like engage, for example, us, the Democratic staff, in fighting against this rule, hey, look, there are 17 scientists who commented against this rule. So that's really important, but it does take time and it's not so fun. But it's a great way to get involved um, on the federal level. I'm just not familiar with the state or local levels nearly as much, so I'm just ignoring it completely, so sorry about that. Um, so um, participation in briefings is a great way for scientists to get involved, although it is invitation only. Here's a briefing room. So when committees meet to talk about stuff uh, in, either, in a couple different kinds of uh, hearings, they often invite witnesses. So here's the actual members, and then the witnesses are sitting at this table here. And in the case of natural resources, scientists are often witnesses. For example, when we were having hearings on fisheries or on endangered species. So um, you can, if invited, participate in briefings and testify in these hearings. They can range from like a happy, fun thing where everyone loves it, like everyone loves ocean observation, nobody likes to be taken surprised by hurricanes, like that was a pretty bipartisan hearing, to not so bipartisan. And, the hearings on, for example, the Endangered Species Act can get quite vigorous. So this would be on the invitation of the staff who are asking on behalf of the ranking member or, or chairman. But so the best way to get involved that way is to just be visible. Like I'm often in charge of finding people to testify. 
And I'm like, okay, I need someone who's gonna talk about, you know, who's gonna, I don't know, talk about the green crab explosion, because we would amazingly be having a hearing on green crab, which probably we won't, so. Um, but we're gonna talk about the green crab explosion. Okay, I need to find who's working that. I'm gonna go immediately to Google. So this is what ties into the social media. If you're not findable, we can't find you. Um, I should note that we have no travel funds to bring people down to briefings, so that is a major factor in who actually gets in front of these members, but if you can do it, it's a really valuable way to get FaceTime and to get your point across. Um, you can go down and lobby yourself or yell at groups who are paid to lobby for you to do what you want. The environmental nonprofits can be, usually try to represent the science with reasonably well, depending on what branch of science you're in. Um, or academic associations like the American Geophysical Union. Um, there are also briefings. Uh, this is a briefing with James, Cameron, with James Cameron, who came to Congress and talked about the importance of ocean exploration. That's the president of Woods Hole there who came with him. So that was really effective. Um, they just came and a briefing is, is just like an informal, basically, lecture. And, well, it can be formal, but it's just a lecture. It's not a formal hearing with members. It's with the staff. So you can come and talk. We have a lot of briefings. We had a really good one on the effect of climate change on fisheries that springs to mind, which is scientists talking to staff members about their science. And, of course, you can go yourself. Um, they really only care if you're their constituent. You can have the best science in the world, but if you're not their constituent, they don't really care all that much unless it's built to another group that they do care about. So it's really your constituents, that, your representatives that matter. But they will make an effort to meet with you, or at least, again, not the member themselves, but the staff person who is relevant. So if you're a natural, if you're an ecologist like I am, you'd really want to be with that natural resources staffer who works on those issues. Finally, as I said before, the best thing is to be visible and accessible. It, be findable if people want to find you. That is the best way. And, you know, it's Congress. Don't expect too much too fast. So to conclude, um, I, again, to go back to that idea of inputs and connectivity, this is a map of the internet of city to city connections. So here's North America, South America, Europe, Asia, uh, India, Africa, and Australia down there. Um, so this shows that even though when you're putting things out there, you have, can have the best inputs in the world, but unless you have the connectivity, you may not be able to talk to everybody who you want to talk to. Um, the, even the internet doesn't actually connect the whole world. So paying attention to what you're putting out there, but, and most importantly, how you're putting it out there and who you're talking to and who your audience is, is the way to make either your science or your social media or your policy the most effective. Um, so none of this would have been possible without many wonderful funders and collaborators and advisors and volunteers. Um, so many thanks to them. And uh, with that, I would love to take any questions. It, can, it really depends on the kind of hearing. We are often looking for scientists because, um, how do I say this tactfully? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, it, we, we often want someone, to, especially with environmental issues, we find that on the Democratic side, scientists often best represent those issues and what we're trying to do with them. Like, endangered species are important, and we like them. Um, so, um, I'm actually allowed to be partisan for my job, so I don't have to be fully objective. Uh, but <laughs> uh, so take it all with a grain of salt. I am partisan. Um, so we so we'd be looking for someone. Primarily, we want to find someone who's an expert in the issue, but they don't have to be the best expert ever. They want we want an expert, and we want an expert who can speak to a general audience because. Uh, Congress people and senators are almost all lawyers and businessmen. There are very few scientists, very few people with technical training of any time. There's some doctors and dentists too, I suppose, but mostly lawyers. So you it's basically a general audience and often a hostile general audience. So you need someone who has some experience and won't completely fold up and, and perish if you start getting asked hostile questions. And the reason it depends is because some hearings we know are gonna be more hostile than others. Um, I'd, we did a hearing, as I mentioned, on the IQ system, which funds the Ocean Observation Network of the US, and that was not a controversial hearing. So I was able to invite a Scripps professor who I knew was a wonderful speaker, but she wasn't really combative. 
So she, but she did a great job just representing the importance of the science, and that was fine, because we knew she wasn't going to be asked hostile questions. But for the Endangered Species Act hearing, or for Fisheries Hearings, Magnus and Stevens Act, then we need people who can really stand up to some very, uh, maybe not factually challenging, but like very uh, hostile questioning. And, and they will sometimes go personal. So it's someone who, who also can deal with that. So that's a sort of a long rambling answer to it completely depends. Uh, we, the best thing is to A, be findable. Like, so when we're looking for that topical area expert, we can find you and B, if we know you have uh, experience in speaking to a general audience, like that's great. Um, we often use the nonprofits to find people too, like, because we're, again, we're the Democrats. So we'll like, call up Oceania or Ocean Conservative and be like, hey, do you know a scientist who can talk about dolphins? So that's another way. Oh, okay. Thank you. My question is a social media question. And when it comes down to you know, cutting edge young scientists who are doing work, they're also having to prioritize a lot of work, family, you know, balance issues as you know, every, everyone else you know, in a mm -hmm. profession that really requires an enormous time commitment you know, at particular stages of your career to you know, be engaged in. So, it seems to me there's kind of a self-selected group when you look at your really wonderful and astonishing pictures of the impact of using social media to mm -hmm. connect. You're also talking about a sol very self-selected group of scientists who are making that a priority or who have the time to do that, who are um, you know, not up in the middle of the night trying to feed a baby at the same time that they're you know, doing everything else. So how, how can institutions like ours actually represent our scientists who may be an important voice but might not have the time to prioritize being engaged with a blog or Twittering every day and all of that. Right. Yeah, first, first I would say that it doesn't, I mean, it, it all depends on your purpose on social media. So, for example, many people who are up in the middle of the night feeding babies have found social media to be wonderful because it gives them a community of other scientists who are also up in the middle of the night feeding babies. There's a very large uh, life in, like work-life balance community <laughs> on both blogs and Twitter with people offering each other mutual support and strategies. Um, so it doesn't always have to be about your science outreach for people to find it useful. But to answer your second question, on an institutional level, um, the best way is through having an organized strategy and a consistent policy. Um, I worked extensively with the Scripps Public Information Officers when I was in grad school, which were enormously helpful because I could not necessarily do all this organization myself and it was, they were able to help pick out the higher priority outreach from the lower priority outreach, for example, and we were able to work together to create resources to answer common questions and whatnot. So from an institutional perspective, I think it's really valuable to have a communication person whose job it is to help herd the cats. Um, the institution itself will have to decide how much of a priority they want to make uh, doing this kind of outreach and how much the cats are going to be poked as they get herded to contribute materials. But one way of making it more efficient is to have a shared institution blog where no, everyone's not trying to build their own individual audience, but all the scientists can contribute. So, that way, people who want to know just can go right to that blog. Uh, we did this pretty successfully on a cruise in 2009. We had a blog. I mean, cruise, I mean, I, I didn't sleep for like three weeks, but the, we split up all the blog entries, and so everyone just had to write one once a week between the number of people. And that was not too strenuous to write one once a week. So there are different strategies that might be employed. Um, I have a question about, I have two questions about mm -hmm. the plastics mm -hmm. data. Um, the first is, the California hotspot, or the Eastern Pacific hotspot yeah. that's developed over the last, let's say, 20 years. Mm -hmm. The first question is, is there anything known about the source of those plastics, and are they coming from California itself, where they're just dumping um, you know, barge, barge materials mm -hmm. off of California? And then the second question is, can you use um, light-stable isotope geochemistry to go back and figure out the source and age of some of these plastics in the water? 
Um, the sources are not known. I mean, most people come up with various, so far as I can tell, completely not based on data percentages for what comes from land-based sources and what comes from ocean-based sources. The 80-20 is floating out there. People have tracked it down. It's not based on anything, so I would discard that. But yeah, the two main sources are litter from land, either deliberately dumped um, or accidentally washed in. Or, so for example, in California, you have the Mediterranean climate. So people litter into the canyons all year round, and then you get a big rain, and it all goes into the ocean. Uh, Sea-based sources regarding fishing activities and accidental loss of containers, and deliberate dumping from before Marpole Annex 5, or illegal dumping today. It's impossible to tell with the microplastic what the original source was. You can tell what kind of plastic it is. Um, you, the easiest way is through various kinds of spectroscopy, um, FTR and Raman are what most people use. Um, but you, then you only know that it's polyethylene or polypropylene. In terms of tracing the isotopes, so I spent a year bugging geochemists at Scripps, basically saying, is there a magical isotope that I can measure that will say how long a piece of plastic has been in the ocean? And nobody uh, at least had an easy answer for a poor lost biologist. Um, their problem with the plastic material itself is that it's derived from petroleum, so you would get the answer would be petroleum. Um, and there doesn't seem to be anything associated with being in the ocean that would be unique. But it is a, a very important question. Because if we could just know how long those pieces have been in the ocean, you could run the circulation models backwards and get a sense of where it came from. But um, currently, that's not known. I spent, I spent a bunch of time trying to figure out a way to develop a plastic age metric. Uh, I mostly looked at carbonyl formation on the surface. And it might be promising, um, but I only aged them for three years, so it's still ongoing at Scripps to see if it actually, the, if the variance gets cut down with time. I can talk way more about that if you want to. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I feel in my heart like talking to Congress would be a good thing, mm -hmm. but when I hear that legislators are not going to have their minds changed by hearing science, mm -hmm. um, what's the advantage to speaking at the committees? Are we convincing, teaching the staff so that the staff can change the legislators' minds, or are we simply informing the legislation or informing them about their constituents since I'm a, I am one constituent? Right. Um, yes, it is, in the vast majority of cases, informing the staff. Um, the staff, uh, in, uh, each, each of the, the members can't do everything, so may, they have interest areas that they are particularly interested in, and they know a lot about those, but they may not know a lot about their areas outside of their interest areas. So for, for with fisheries, you know, the inland, the inland members don't know a lot about fisheries, don't necessarily especially make that a priority, but they still vote on these issues. So that is very valuable to talk about those issues and what, the, what they are. But oh, um, So the staff, the staff is pretty important in those things, although of course it is the member who directs the staff to, their prior, to determine what their priorities are. Uh, it is also important to figure out where the center of the conversation is. So we're always trying to frame the conversation. We're not going to necessarily convince certain members, but if you have you know, scientists who are the expert in their field saying, no, this is like, this is the case. Um, it helps move that conversation forward. And it's a lot harder to say, to be like, oh, well, I don't believe the world expert on X than it is if you don't have that world expert on X at all. So that's sort of, that's sort of the idea. It's in, and it gets in the, it gets, it's in the congressional record. Uh, people reference it later. And these debates are used to figure out what legislation might be possible. So that's the, that's the cheery version. A lot of it is theatrical. I mean, it is a lot of like political theatrics, and a lot of it is not going to go anywhere, but you just don't know what's what at the time. That's the tricky part. <laughs> I think we have time for one more, two more. <laughs> so um, my question is um, about the coral pathogens, and do, do they? Um, or are they found on pumice or kelp or other things floating naturally, or are they um, just an opportunistic pathogen with, uh, at, that's traveling on the plastic? Um, it's an excellent question, and I don't know. Um, I, can, I have never found them on any other substrate, and I didn't see in the literature that they were commonly rafting. Like we had, were not aware that they were rafting until we found them. 
Um, but I'm not extremely familiar with their life history, so uh, this is, that's about the extent of my knowledge. They popped up um, fairly recently in the 2000s as a problem for coral reefs, but it's hard to say if they were already there or if they were an effect of multiple stressors and just were sort of a more opportunistic infection. Other people might know the answer to that, but unfortunately, I, I do not. All right, last one, Jerry. Miriam, in terms of um, engaging scientists in, as you were saying, the, the rulemaking process, for mm -hmm. example. So social media is like a walk in the park to navigate compared to the congressional process, at least in my experience. And yeah. it takes, it's a full-time job just to figure out you know, how to do that. Are there any sort of go-to sites that, that you have or favorite places where we can become aware of what the sort of pressing issues of the day are and, and maybe you know, familiarize ourselves a little bit. I mean, that's part of our challenge here is I think knowing when to weigh in, mm -hmm. when to involve um, scientists and, and just keeping up with that is a huge, yeah. <laughs> huge piece of, of the pie. I know, I can't really keep up with it myself. <laughs> it's pretty challenging. We pretty much just put out fires um, from our end. And the uh, majority only gives notice before a hearing, so we don't even really know it's coming necessarily. Um, yeah, I don't know of any central site because basically because everyone's interested in different things because, I mean, for example, my examples are very oceanography and ocean observation based because that's my background, but my understanding is there's a lot more of a molecular and biomedical and developmental focus here, and I would just not be, I'm just not familiar with those resources. I do recommend a nonprofit group called the Compass for help um, in if you ever are invited to testify or they're there or to create materials for outreach. Their goal is to help scientists do both governmental and informal outreach, and they have all these great tools. So they might be a good first resource. Do you have anything to add to that? Did you? Oh, well, just that we've actually talked about having yeah. uh, either a Compass or an NSF yeah. workshop here at some point. So just kind of keep yeah. your ears for Yeah, but in terms of just a simple, of keeping track of what on earth Congress is doing, it's like really difficult even from inside the building. <laughs> All right, with that, let's thank Miriam once again. Thank you. Thanks, Bobby.